got to get my face out of the way. <laughs> anyway, hello, hello. Um, although it says SAT Worksheet 103 at the top here, these three concepts, add or remove, specific task, sentence placement, they're equally relevant to both the ACT and the SAT. Uh, and they make up a little over a third of each test uh, on the grammar section. Uh, section one of the ACT, section two of the SAT. So uh, if you've gone through worksheets 101 and 102, you've gotten a feel for a lot of, a lot of the nuts and bolts grammar rules that you're gonna need to know. That said, worksheets 103 and 105 take you through a large portion of the grammar set or the writing section, section one of the ACT, section two of the SAT, uh, teaching you the questions that go beyond the grammar. And the mistake that a lot of students make is they think that if they learn the grammar rules and they apply the grammar rules, then they can kind of cruise through and they take that same mentality to these questions. So the grammar rules, once you know them, it's black and white. It's a very binary thing. You can tell which question's right and which three answers are wrong. But whenever a question asks something of you, so any one of these questions, it becomes a content-based question. Whenever a question specifically asks you to make a decision about something, it's relating to the content of the passage. What does that mean? That means you're taking a different approach or a different mentality to these questions. So rather than just trying to recognize grammar rules, you're, you're being tested on your critical reasoning and your reading comprehension and your ability to make a decision when given directions. So for these questions, you may be asked to add or remove something. You need to make a decision whether or not it belongs. So it's in your best interest actually to zoom out, read the paragraph that contains that sentence, and then once you know what the paragraph's about, you can make an informed decision about whether or not it belongs. Specific task will ask you to do something specifically that the author wants. So you have to really read what that task is carefully. The answer is, is actually in the question based off of your ability to follow directions. Sentence placement is when uh, we're trying to figure out where a sentence belongs and you need to use contextual clues to figure that out. So all of these questions are more of the thinking questions. And for these, you need to permit yourself time to do that thinking and to do the, the research required to get them right. So with no further ado, and I am gonna warn you, this video may be a little bit longer. Uh, we'll start with adding and removing specific tasks and sentence placement. So if you wanna see a later topic, you'll just fast forward through the video, but let's start with adding and removing. Okay. So a lot of times you'll be asked whether or not a sentence belongs, whether or not um, should the writer add this here, right? Or the writer is thinking of deleting something and you have to make a decision about that. It's really simple. You're gonna take your time reading the paragraph. You're gonna make a decision about what the main purpose or main idea of the paragraph is, what its focus is. Then from that, it's really simple. If you're going to keep it or add it, you're going to keep it or add it because it is relevant to the paragraph. It's either a good example that helps to elaborate on a main point of the paragraph, uh, or it adds uh, additional information that is in any way relevant. When do you get rid of it? The majority of the times you get rid of it because it's not really related to the main idea of the paragraph. It's a distraction. It's only tangentially related, meaning it just touches. So that's why it's really important to read the paragraph carefully enough so that you know what the main focus of the paragraph is. Uh, other than the fact that it may be a distraction, another reason you may get rid of it is because it's redundant. It's giving you information that you already have somewhere else in the paragraph or, or even sometimes to the passage. So that's why it's important to pay attention to what you're reading in the passage. So let's take a look at this example that I made up here, and then we'll look at some examples from past exams. Uh, so because I'm a kind man, I will read this aloud. Uh, although President Abraham Lincoln abhorred slavery, when he was, by the way, I want you to think about what is this paragraph about? What is it that the author, the main point that the author is trying to communicate? So that's what you're thinking as this is being read. So although Abraham Lincoln abhorred slavery, when he was sworn into office in 1861, he promised the South that he did not intend to abolish the practice. So that's the topic sentence. In fact, Lincoln prioritized keeping the Union intact 
which to him meant not agitating the South by challenging the practice of slavery. During his inaugural address, Lincoln tried to mollify Southerners by stating, I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere, no purpose to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. So if you're given this sentence in bold and think about what you would do, I'll give you a moment to, to we're all read it aloud, but I'll give you a moment to think about it. Would this belong if we wanted to add it at the end of the paragraph right here? So some politicians like Pennsylvania representative Thaddeus Stevens Sin, took an open abolitionist stance. So what do you think? Does that belong? Hopefully you're able to say no, right? This paragraph is about Lincoln's uh, initial stance on slavery and the way he messaged it when he took office. So to randomly bring in at the end of the paragraph some representative from Pennsylvania and his stance on slavery. Yeah, it's talking about slavery and a position on slavery, but it's not relevant to the paragraph. So if you look at the answer choices here, it's got to be D all the way. Right, the paragraph's focus is on Lincoln. Uh, and you always want to make sure the reason, so you, you don't want to just make a decision on yes or no, you want to make sure the reasoning makes sense as well. So it provides a specific example of a politician who opposed slavery. Yeah, it does all that, but that doesn't mean it belongs. Yes, because it demonstrates not, that not all politicians shared Lincoln's stance. Again, it does do that, but it doesn't belong. It's off topic. So the reasoning's right, but the decision of yes is no. No, because it contradicts the writer's claim that Lincoln did not intend to abolish slavery. Um, it doesn't say anything about Lincoln, so it doesn't contradict anything about Lincoln. And I'm going to warn you, you're going to see contradicts a lot under no. I've rarely have ever seen anything written that contradicts what, what the paragraph is saying. Why? Probably because it would stick out like a sore thumb. Take this, for instance. Uh, John is really healthy. He works out every morning. And then here's the next sentence. John rarely gets up to work out and is very lazy and has a terrible eating habit. Immediately, you'd say, what on earth? So the test rarely, if ever, does it, they offer the fact that it contradicts, but if you really push on that word, the sentence that they offer rarely, if ever, actually contradicts what's said. All right, let's look at one from the test just to get some practice here. Or we may even look at two quick ones. So I've already circled it in red here. And I apologize, it's gonna be a little bit of an eye test but hopefully you can see everything okay there. So again, we're gonna read the paragraph because it's a keep or delete one. We wanna know whether or not to add it. So we need to know what the paragraph is about. So a woman emerges from a dark background, half in shadow. She wears a curious expression that while it doesn't register happiness, doesn't entertain sadness either. She regards the viewer frankly, much as a viewer might regard her. This photograph, displayed at the Met in New York City was taken in 1867, although it feels immediate, as if its subject were staring back at the viewer in the present moment. It is the work of photographer Julia Margaret Cameron, who is sometimes thought of as a painter who used a camera as her canvas. Okay, so if you think about the main idea of this paragraph, it seems to me like it's to introduce uh, a photograph that's considered a piece of art. So look at the sentence they're offering. It's gonna be about specifically about Julia Cameron. Although Cameron was born in India, for much of her adult life, she lived and worked in the Isle of Wight village of Freshwater, which was then and still remains a popular seaside tourist destination. So in a paragraph that is predominantly about a photograph and the effect it has on the viewer, do we wanna know about where Cameron was born and the fact that the Isle of Wight is a seaside tourist destination. Hopefully you're saying, no, that's so off topic. So if we look at this, no, because it introduces a loosely related fact about Cameron, not about her photography. That is spot on. And I'll give you a moment to look through these other ones. So talking about where she was born doesn't have anything to explain uh, doesn't have anything to do with why her studio would attract people. Uh, 
This you'd probably want to read the rest of the essay, but I'll just tell you it's wrong. But that, that proves the point that you always want to zoom out if you need more information in order to make a decision. And then again, it's just at, it's out of scope and off topic, but this isn't the right reason. Uh, even if her studio was on the Isle of Wight, the whole paragraph is about uh, what the, you know, the photograph itself. So this one would be a clear no. Uh, there are ones that are yes examples, and we'll do one real quickly now. So you're going to read this paragraph right here, or I'll actually read it for you about the uh, play Oklahoma, or musical really. So in the early 1940s, the plots of Broadway musicals were often frivolous and extravagant, little more than excuses for song and dance numbers. Serious plots were reserved for dramatic productions, which lacked music. A turning point in the musical genre, however, came with R Richard Rodgers and Oscar Hammerstein's Oklahoma, fusing high operatic style, a folksy tone, the show about farmers and cowherds in the early 20th century Oklahoma Territory would find wild success in theaters around the world and also pave the way for this new kind of musical to become a fixture in American theater. So what they give us is this. Oklahoma, the title of the show, the first musical to feature a sophisticated story served by music and dance elements. So the question is whether or not that added description of what Oklahoma is, being the first musical to have a sophisticated story uh, with music and dance elements, whether or not that's relevant. And if you read this paragraph carefully enough and you think about what it's about, that we do want it. Why? Well, it says that forever musicals were silly. They were frivolous. They didn't have plots. Plots were reserved for dramatic productions. And then it says we had a turning point, and the turning point was Oklahoma. So the question is, what makes Oklahoma the turning point? What makes Oklahoma the turning point? Well, it's the first musical that actually has a good plot to go along with the music and the dance. Uh, so it supports the claim made earlier in the sentence, the fact that it's a turning point. That's, that's why we want it. If you look at these other answer choices, we can go through why they don't work. Uh, The first sentence talks about frivolous song and dance numbers. So this is not an example of that. So that's why that's wrong. It's not an example of, if you read carefully, the first sentence. The information is very much relevant. It's relevant to what we just talked about. And the assertions that it had a sophisticated plot not repeated in the next sentence. So that's how we know that A all the way. But as you're starting to see, hopefully, you have to take a little bit more of a critical eye to these problems. You have to slow down, collect the necessary information, and make an informed decision. These aren't problems that you necessarily want to whip through, because if you do, you're going to miss them. OK, so I know this video is um, going to be a little bit of a longer one, but Let's hit these other two concepts, and I promise we'll go a little faster through these. So specific task. Specific task is really straightforward. The answer is in the question. I'll say that again. The answer is in the question. So let's read the question really carefully. Which choice most clearly demonstrates that Susan B. Anthony was a leader in the women's suffrage movement? Supported? So Susan B. Anthony supported the movement for women's suffrage in the 1800s. Supported doesn't make you a leader. Tolerated doesn't make you a leader. Approved of doesn't make you a leader. Headed makes you a leader. Let's see how this plays out on an actual test question. I specifically have picked a question here, number 28, that stumps a lot of students. So I'll read it aloud. Uh, and with these, we want to nail what the question wants from us first. But I'll read the paragraph in a second. Which choice develops the sentence's supporting example in a way that makes it most consistent 
with the preceding example, the example preceding it. So we're going to look really closely at the example that precedes this example and then decide what pattern we're following. So the author of the papers in question favored the word whilst over while and on over upon. Analysis of other documents written by men revealed that Madison frequently used the word whilst. Conversely, or on the other hand, Hamilton never incorporated this word into his prose. So that's our preceding example, is Madison uses a word, Hamilton doesn't. Okay. The same held for on versus upon. So if the same holds for on versus upon, then that would mean that Madison uses it, Hamilton doesn't. So Madison regularly used the first word while Hamilton rarely did. If you look at these other options, they're not going to strike you as obviously wrong unless you've really read the question carefully. These words were used as clues to determine the author's identity. That could very well be true, and it makes sense, but it does not answer what 28 wants from you, and that's what you really have to remind yourself. Some writers show a tendency to use one word instead of the other. That's also true, but again, has nothing to do with the question. Hamilton had one linguistic preference, but Madison had another. Getting closer, but it's not following the same pattern. That Madison uses it, Hamilton doesn't. This is very vague and nondescript, so it's not really helping. So at the end of the day, with these specific task ones, you want something that is, is descript and answers the question. You want to avoid anything that's vague and doesn't really add anything and something that doesn't actually complete the, the specific task that they give you. Okay. We have one more question type to look like, look at from this worksheet. And that last question type, and this is probably everyone's least favorite because it requires the most amount of work, but these, these can be quite engaging. And luckily you're only gonna get maybe two to four of these a test because the test makers know that they require a good amount of work. But these are the, sentence placement questions. So they give you a sentence that's out of place and you need to figure out exactly where it belongs. There's a whole approach that I outline here, uh, but I'm gonna kind of just streamline the main ideas. Obviously you can go into this worksheet and read it more in detail. But when they give you the sentence that's out of place, what you need to determine is what about the sentence is gonna allow me to put it in its appropriate place. Meaning you want to read the sentence that's out of place really carefully. You want to take special note of transition words, last names, demonstrative pronouns like this method, that decision, those ideas. Because they, if they're mentioning something like a last name or this method, then the name of the person or the method had to have come before. So you know that it has to come after something that was already mentioned. A transition word, like on the other hand, you have to say, okay, it's shifting and comparing to something that came before. But you want to really read the sentence carefully to be able to pinpoint what's going to allow you to place it. What you'll do after you read the sentence is you'll start to read the paragraph and you'll just look for where it belongs. And if you get two sentences that don't necessarily flow, that can be an indication that maybe that the sentence that you need to place should go in between them. Anyway, I think it's going to make a lot more sense if we look at this example here. So this is an example I created. And then after we do this one, we'll look at a test example. So we're going to know where sentence five should be. So we're going to read sentence five really carefully. And we're going to make, we're not going to give it any, um, we're not gonna give extra weight to the fact of where it is right now. We're not gonna say, oh, this is where it likely belongs. No, it could be anywhere. So you almost have to pretend like we're just taking it out, out of the paragraph. But anyway, sentence five, before then, so before then, then means some time. Abolitionists adopted it, we have to figure out what it is, as a symbol of freedom and liberty in the 1830s. Because of its inscription, proclaim liberty throughout all the land onto all the inhabitants thereof. Okay, so as we read this paragraph, before then has to be the 1830s. We know that before some time, right? Before some time, before then, so then is here, before then has to be the 1830s. 
and we have to figure out kind of what it is. I know that seems confusing right now, but let's read the paragraph and I think everything will come into place. Often the Denzians of a particular city will derive pride from a local landmark, despite having a vague understanding of its history. For instance, the Liberty Bell located in Old City, Philadelphia serves as a source of immense pride, despite being poorly understood by most of Philadelphia's own. Where did the bell come from? Why was it cracked? When did it transcend its identity as a normal bell to become a Liberty Bell? So this seems like a clear topic sentence. Let's keep on reading. Purchased in 1752 from the London Bell Company, Lester and Pack, the poorly crafted bell cracked upon its arrival in Philadelphia the first time it was rung. Recast twice after the original crack, the Liberty Bell remained Philadelphia's main town hall bell until it cracked again and was removed from the town hall's tower in the second half of the 19th century. So in the late 1800s or second half of the 19th century, the bell was removed. This is the only thing that comes after, right, the late 1800s. That's the only thing that comes after the 1830s. So before then has to be referring to before the late 1800s. So sentence five has to come after six. Otherwise it wouldn't fit. So as you can see, there's, there's a lot of thinking that goes on here. You're, you're almost playing detective. Uh, you always want to kind of read the sentence carefully, gather what you think may be clues, and then start reading the paragraph. Let's try it on one more problem, and then we'll, we'll finish up and you'll have a chance to do this worksheet on your own. As you can tell, this is a mega worksheet. There are over 80 problems on this worksheet. So you may want to talk to your tutor and not do the whole thing in one go, maybe do the odds or evens only and see how that goes. But completing this will really help you develop the way you want to approach these three types of questions and the thinking for them. Okay, anyway, sentence placement. It's at, so our approach is it's asking us about sentence four, so we're gonna read sentence four and look for clues. Carter, so we have to already have a Carter, fell in love with the Amherst collection of, so we have to have the Amherst collection of Egyptian artifacts and began sketching them in his free time. So Carter, Carter, uh, Carter <laughs> falls in love with a collection of artifacts and begins sketching them. Okay, let's read the paragraph. Though having little formal education, young Howard Carter, so now we know who Carter is, had one standout talent, he could draw. He sometimes accompanied his father, a well-respected illustrator and painter, on visits to his clients, including the well-connected, oh, so here's the Amherst family, who had an amateur interest in Egyptian archeology. span Three sketches so impressed the Amherst that they recommended him to, so right here, as I'm reading this paragraph, this is where I pause. Three sketches, three sketches of what? When did we start to talk about sketches? Howard visits the Amherst family who has an archeolo uh, Egyptian archeology span collection and then three sketches impress the Amherst that they recommend him, well, who's him at this point? Maybe Carter? To uh, Percy Newberry who hired him as one of his, his uh, as a member of his expedition to the tombs of Egypt. So the question I ask is, well, what, what are these three sketches we're talking about? Four needs to come before three, okay? Four needs to come after sentence two. Why? Because Carter falls in love with the Amherst family's collection of artifacts and he been, begins sketching them in his free time. So Howard sketching the artifacts enables there to be three sketches that impress the family. Now all the pieces click into place. So again, you're not gonna get many of these attest. It's, you're gonna have less than four, but when you do these, you really need to uh, be on the top of your game of kind of noticing everything and looking for anything that could potentially be a clue. Uh, anyway, to summarize, whether it's adding and removing, where you have to get the main idea of the paragraph and then make a decision about whether or not something belongs, whether it's specific tasks where you really need to read the question carefully and determine what the task is, 
or whether it's trying to place a sentence where you need to play detective, all of these require you not to be on autopilot. You need to really pay attention to the content and be sure that you're making the best informed decision that you can. If you don't, then you're jeopardizing your ability to get the question right. Hopefully this packet will serve as excellent practice where you can really cultivate these skills and feel more comfortable with these questions on the test. Good luck and see you soon, hopefully in another video.